Welcome to the Homeschool Mama Self-Care Podcast. I'm Teresa Wiedrich from CapturingTheCharmLife.com. If you are a homeschool mama challenged by doubt, not sure you can do this homeschool thing. If you're a homeschool mama challenged by overwhelm, there are just too many things to do. Or if you are a homeschool mama unsure that the way you're showing up in your homeschool isn't the way you want to be showing up in your homeschool, then this is the podcast for you. I'm here to encourage you in your homeschool journey to help you strategize ways to turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. So welcome, homeschool mama. Today, I get to introduce you to Jennifer Bryant. She is the founder of practicalfamily.org and host of the Practical Family podcast. Jen is trained in Christian theology, apologetics, and education. She encourages families to build practical skills for healthy communication, strengthens moms for real-life struggles, and helps women to discover their unique calling. Jen is married to Bruce, and she's mom to two precious preteens. Her favorite things include reading, brainstorming, singing with her kids, laughing out loud with her husband, and making food for people. She lives in Honolulu, Hawaii, and dreams of taking her family on marvelous adventures across the globe. I, ironically, dream of taking my family on marvelous adventures to Hawaii. But until then, let's listen to a discussion between Jen and I on a very pertinent topic, and that discussion takes the form of discussing kids and dealing with conflict management in our homes, learning how to address our big emotions, which sometimes means we're reparenting ourselves, and learning how to show up for ourselves and our kids ever so imperfectly. Sometimes that means we need to give permission to ourselves to take breaks. Certainly that means that we need to practice dealing with our frustrations and anger in our homeschool, knowing our strengths and how we engage our kids, Always returning to the question, is our homeschool actually working for us and practicing self-compassionate techniques that actually help us to deal with all of these frustrations? I'm really excited to share a very meaningful, very useful conversation with you that might impact your homeschool life. As a side note, I have recently released the the Big Emotions Journaling Workbook for Homeschool Mamas, which I hope can be an extension of this conversation. So how can we address our interpersonal challenges or those big emotions in our homeschool? Well, Jen says with over. O means observe, V means vent, E means embrace, and R means reframe. A great way to remind us how we need to address our big emotions. To get the most out of this conversation, we got to listen to it. So let's get started. It's such a pleasure to have you here, and thank you for coming all the way from Hawaii. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I didn't need to take a plane, so that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, Jen, would you introduce yourself to the listeners? You're a homeschool mom in Hawaii. Yes, I am. Uh, yes, I'm Jennifer Bryant. I uh, founded practicalfamily.org uh, after coming home from working full time. And uh, I didn't decide to homeschool right away. In fact, I thought it was um, not something I would venture into. But it turns out that just got opened up doors for that. And I can share more of that story, too, in a little bit. But for now, yes, we're in Hawaii. I have two kids. They're, they're two. One's a preteen and one just became a teen yesterday. So that's yeah, been. I saw that. Congratulations. That's the anniversary yeah. to your motherhood. Thank you. It is. Thank you very much. It is the milestone for me, isn't it? (laughs) It is. I really think it is. I know we should like probably remember our oldest child's birthdays, (laughs) remember them on their birthdays, but it is a significant moment for us. Everything changed. Everything changed Mm -hmm. in um, 15 hours, or should we say in 10 months, but everything changed and in all the beauty and on all the challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really so congratulations. Did. Chloe is your 13 year old. Yes. Chloe's 13. Asher is 12. Yeah. Uh, they're only 11 months apart. So homeschooling them um, has been uh, difficult and 
easier, I think, in in just a lot of ways, right? Because when you have kids who are, who have larger age gaps, you have to accommodate for all the ages, all at the same time. And I feel, I feel like, okay, God didn't give me that, but the challenges of having two, a boy and a girl close together come with its own (laughs) issues, I think. Yes. But overall, it's been really fun. It's been good to have them at home. Yeah, I actually identify a lot with what you just said, because there are so many freedoms and so much beauty in this lifestyle. Uh, you get to know your kids in a way that you just don't. Like I've had people remark that you really know your child well. And true, also, they're opening up as like um, a newly written book for me as well. Because they, I mean, it's not just me that doesn't fully know them, but they're learning about who they are as they grow up as well. But there's that beauty of being able to be with them um, in a very concerted way. And the obvious challenge in that is that sometimes there's stuff that's happening that's not always perfect and pleasant in our homeschools, in our homes. And we get to be very close to it. In fact, you had a very funny reel because uh, you talked about... (laughs) Which one was it? Oh, I think it was on TikTok. You're on TikTok. Very I am. Yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> you said, I'd like a break from helping kids feel their feelings. I'm like, mm. yeah, <laughs> I get that. Yes. This is one of the, the issues. <clears throat> um, when I think about things I didn't expect out of my homeschool journey, I did not expect to teach less of the what the content and so much more of the how yeah this is how we approach not just subjects but life conversation conflict (laughs) it's incredible how much coaching we have to do as parents and as they get older it's it's more of the mental gymnastics of helping them to understand I mean and I have to give myself grace too, for we will get angry. I mean, the Bible says God got angry when the Israelites walked away from him again. And so we can expect that of our kids, of course. So in my anger, do not sin. In my anger, do not, <laughs> do not try not to yell at them too much. Of course it happens, but, but it's given me so much more opportunity to, to sit and think about, okay, what's really happening? Am I is my goal just to make them stop fighting or make them be quiet? Sometimes. My larger goal. Sometimes it is. Sorry. (laughs) Sometimes it is. But if my larger goal is to raise humans, is to raise people who will be adults in this world, I have to teach them how to resolve their conflict. And, oh, it it just took me back to school in a lot of ways, Uh you know. That is that's exactly the thing that I identify as the challenging part of homeschooling. It's mm-hmm. about how I'm relating to all of that, my big emotions in it, because I've learned that my understanding of my own feelings with anger or my own feelings with you fill in the blank, whatever feeling, how I've already learned about that, how I've already related to that or not related to it and told myself I'm not going to feel that feeling because it's too complicated. Mm-hmm. That oh. just gets all the layers get pulled back from that and I don't have a choice but to deal with that Mm -hmm. Um, or at least it feels that way because I've chosen to sign up to do what you're saying to address Mm -hmm. the big emotions to help them understand themselves and Mm -hmm. to whatever extent I understand myself I'm able to help them and if I'm not which is the case too because we're all growing together then I have to figure that out alongside them Or a lot, and that the whole thing is just a lot of energy. It is, it and it's unexpected, right? It's unexpected that um, we'd have to expend this much. And I think when when things, when circumstances like this hit us, it from any side, as adults, whether it's our own friendships or something going on at church or in the community, and we don't feel prepared for what's about to happen, our our humanness will react in a way that shows us where our insecurities lie, you know, and, and we have to be willing to address those things. As you say, I, you know, admittedly, you know, we don't want to go there. They're either uncomfortable or we don't, we just don't know how to address them or we're conflicted morally because, well, the Bible says this, or I think a good Christian mom should act like this. And it, it convolutes it if we're not willing to really ask simple questions 
like, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? What, you know, whose responsibility is this really, you know, and, and those are the steps that not everyone is taught. I, I didn't grow up understanding. I don't know a lot of people that had a real strong education in this when they were kids. And uh, there's a popular term right now called reparenting. Mm -hmm. And often it's related to like trauma based childhoods, Mm -hmm. but I think it's everybody. And it's everybody's experience that we need to reparent ourselves and to show up for ourselves in a way that we need that maybe our parents didn't show up. And when we say that, that actually assumes too, that we aren't going to perfectly show up for our kids either. Right. Absolutely. And it's just part of the part for the course, I guess. But it's really hard to accept because we moms are like, how do I do this right? How do I make sure that they feel loved, that they get all the things? And then we take on as homeschool moms, all the different elements of homeschool, which just turns up the whole, you know, energy or intention of motherhood to a whole different level. And, um, and then we have to, we have to say, um, are we perfect human beings able to be God for our children? Or are we these human most uh, invested human beings in these people's lives, but not capable of doing everything perfectly all the time? Right, right. That intentionality to be invested, rather than to seek perfection or to chase the right way to do it. I find that that is probably one of the biggest contentions in the spirit of the homeschool moms that I speak with. It's, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. Am I doing this enough? Am I, am I teaching them enough? Am I with them enough? Right. <clears throat> and that line is so elusive, yes. but, but it's the feeling and, and it's okay yeah. to express the feeling like, gosh, I, I don't feel like they, they are getting what they may get in a, in an institution, <laughs> who has all the resources and multiple people to pour into them versus just me, just me, I'm it, or me and my husband or, you know, whoever their community is. And that it's a very real valid feeling that we don't feel like we're enough for our kids. But I would lean more and more toward what you said about the intentional investment, because it takes seeing, it takes being an observer and a student of your own students, right? Mm-hmm. Student of yeah. your children to just to notice, you know, strengths to notice um, when things are getting out of hand to notice when we need a break. And I'm so glad your podcast is focused on, on, um, on mama self care in this way, because not only do we need a break, we need, we need permission to give ourselves breaks. We need permission to give our kids permission Sometimes I feel like we can be so driven by our schedules that mm-hmm. there, there's yeah. no room for that. No, we must finish the math page yeah. right now, you yeah. know? <laughs> or we have to get through this experiment. I know it's messy, but you have to it learn cost us a lot of money. <laughs> yes, I paid a lot for this. <laughs> we are dissecting this thing. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. No, it's true. It's true. So recognizing where those pressures are coming from, mm-hmm. I think is, is key. And that that's why I love to focus on um, coaching or one-on-one or group coaching with moms, because yeah. it's really in the small group times that we get to really unwrap what's really happening. So right. we start with our feelings, right? And then, and then there's room to kind of get down to the core of where do you think this is coming from? You have the strength and the ability and the mind God's given you mm-hmm. to bring these things to the surface and, and deal with them. Or, and this is when we pray, Lord, show me where it is. Show me what, why am I so overwhelmed? Why am I overworked, overtired? Why am I doing more and stressing myself out more Then we can bring those things to the surface and deal yeah. with them in prayer with friends, meditation, you know, There are ways there's hope is my point. And I didn't see any of that. I didn't see any of that when I first started, when I started, it was more about the checklist and getting the things done. Right. (laughs) I sometimes think that I need to rebrand the entire podcast name and I haven't figured out what the name is because I know even for myself that the self-care concept often 
triggers me to think about spa days, which I don't have very many of, maybe a couple times in a decade. <laughs> not very often, but or or all those kind of, you know, sweet, but not really all that effective self care approaches. But for me, I think it the biggest one is really that big emotions thing, big emotions for the homeschool mom. And or at least I'll say that, I think that we can understand ourselves more and grow in greater self awareness when we pay attention to the uncomfortable emotions that we have. They speak. Yeah, they speak to what we're thinking, because there's always thoughts behind those feelings. And Mm -hmm. they might reveal an entire childhood of, you know, a a ribbon of something from childhood that we haven't dealt with, or, you know, it doesn't have to go to childhood. But there's something there that we need to address. And that's the hard stuff of homeschooling. The rest of it Mm -hmm. is actually, I think, fun, the learning (laughs) aspect, and the social Mm -hmm. conversation that everybody has about socialization. I'm just kind of over that one <laughs> doesn't kind of mean anything to me anymore <laughs> yes the organic uh teaching them how to have organic relationships is just in the daily practice of living yeah. in organic relationship I mean it doesn't need to be more complicated but we complicate it when we don't know any other way and you know I grew up in public school yeah. I went to a big private Christian college um yeah uh, I almost went to a big secular college so like I've seen a lot of the sides of that yeah Um, but anyway socialization is we get we can stay here we can come back to it however you want (laughs) to yeah no that yeah (laughs) this discussion about big emotions though or is it like I'd love to I'd love to hear what people think the right way of phrasing that concept is or how they understand it but understanding yourself or self-awareness whatever you know about yourself is how you're going to engage your kids And yet, I mean, I will say it, it doesn't mean that just because you're self-aware and you know how to be familiar with your uncomfortable feelings and know why you're triggered by certain scenarios, there won't come a time where you're like, great, the kids are fighting a learning opportunity in interpersonal conflict. Yay, let's go. (laughs) Oh, sure. Because, and I think it's worth mentioning too that you know, we know we're human. We know even as Christians that we're going to react in our flesh, but okay, let's take it down to a behavioral, even scientific standpoint. Like our brains are going to automatically react to conflict, right? We, We all have that fight or flight tendency, even as parents, when our kids are fighting, we sense danger. Okay. Right. And so let, let's just look at it very simply like that. So as to not feel guilty for having feelings when they come up, our, our right. brains are going to have this elevated sense of there's danger. I'm the mother. I must protect or I must make it stop or something. Mm-hmm. And then it's not only that one, one conflict that's happening. It's usually a lot of other things. Like you're trying yeah. to make food. You're trying to your phone's ringing, people need you for things, you know? So it's all of the things that are floating around us that we have to almost pre-decide that we're going to stay as calm as possible, regardless of what's happening. Or at happening. least practice, yeah. Yes, oh yes, practice. yes, of yeah. course. That That the next time this happens, I don't have to flip out. I don't have to, you know, that's not the only tool in my toolbox is to just handle it and yell at people. And, you know, I've done my fair share of yelling. I mean, of course, you know, it's not like it's not going to happen and we need to give moms a break for that right now. Yeah. Because it's, 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 um, crowd control, damage control, (laughs) but it comes down to like, I need to control the situation. But the, the fact that there is hope in being able to control it in a more gentle way. Right. Let's just try. Let's try. It. And it's probably not going to work the first time <laughs> if we're going from yelling to. <laughs> no, it's not. Gentle. But yeah. it, it's possible. And the kids yeah. sense that. And what we do, um, what, what is the scripture I love? Um, you know, a gentle answer turns away wrath, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's true that people lean in and listen, the lower and the slower you speak. And if your goal is to just love your kids and help them along as they're feeling all these big feelings, then inevitably it helps us to calm ourselves. And the Lord 
yeah, breast that's true. care, you know? Or I even find in reverse that if I'm being self-compassionate, if I'm practicing, you know, hand on heart or looking into the mirror, that one's always very effective to me because I can see that I'm a person outside of me, which sounds weird, but yeah. at the same time, it, you see yourself and say, oh, I'm sorry you're upset or I'm sorry you're frustrated or in tears because if I'm looking at you and you're upset and you may have been yelling at your child, I would be like, I'm sorry. So what was going on? Cause there's probably a good reason. And just like you said, there's not just one reason. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. And then even if you and I both know that that wasn't the right way to approach that, mm-hmm. I would still go, yeah, I'm with you. I'm sorry. I know exactly how that feels. Cause I've been there and mm-hmm. I know you don't want to do this thing. I also know you love your child. You want the best for your child. You don't want a counseling bill when they're 25, but you're willing to affront it. If you have to, (laughs) you want to figure this out before then. And so then I look at you and I go, I'm here with you. I feel for you. And I can accomplish that sometimes just by looking at the mirror for myself. Like I'm a separate person. That's powerful. That's wonderful. How do you approach your children when they're having conflict or what's your ideal approach? Let's just say it that way. (laughs) Well, (laughs) we compare reality to ideal. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. I really do. And I know that like, that's why I (laughs) said practice because especially when you start in this, you think there is just no way I'm ever going to get out of this reactiveness or I'm always going to engage this way. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a form of self-shaming, I think. Like, you're never going to figure this out. You're always going to engage in a way you know you don't want the neighbors seeing or mm-hmm. something. But Or you don't want a podcast. But we're humans. And this is the reality of literally everyone everywhere that they react, just like you said. So then what what is the ideal approach to engaging it, in your opinion? Well, um, what, what I'm seeing develop is because, of course, I don't have the answer to what is the right way to engage this. It really depends on your kid's personality, right? So I think knowing wow. where they're That's coming right. from, because my, like my daughter has, she's very competitive and very passionate and like she, she needs to know the right way to do things. And I don't know if it's a firstborn thing or whatever. <laughs> my son is the secondborn and he will argue to the cows come home and, you know, find his loopholes. And he's very creative at finding loopholes. Okay. So even as they're arguing and she's like, but you said this and he's like, okay. Okay. So I know I said that, but this is what's happening. And so, so he will, he will kind of attack her from the side and from behind. So I'm, I'm watching their tactics Mm -hmm. as individual people. Yeah. Um, if, if I'm in a place where I'm distracted and busy, of course, I'll react more like immediately. I'll, I'll say something like, Hey, what are you doing? What come here? What are you doing? What are you saying to her right now? Stop. No, no, no. Stop. Uh, stop. <laughs> you know, so it'll look a lot like that. Um, but the, the times that I've gone in and I've, I've pre-decided even in the, in the last five seconds, I've pre-decided I'm going to go in, not with the spirit of making this stop right now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go in and I'm going to look at them both. I'm here. Hold on. St- hold on. No, stop talking. Listen to me for a second. What happened? So number one, yeah. what happened? What are the facts? Number two, how did what she said, make you feel or vice versa. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking them questions to get them to ask themselves, why am I upset right now? Right. Exactly. Yeah. That, that goal, the the goal of teaching them to critically think by modeling questions they need to ask themselves is, is what I do for myself now. Yeah. And that whole reparenting thing. Yeah. What is the big deal? Where is this coming from? Why did that upset you so much? Did that hurt your pride? Did yeah. that, um, is there false information happening? Did she say something she didn't say or, you know? Yeah, you feel misrepresented somehow or misunderstood yes. or disrespected, right? We, yeah. So we, we name, we try to name those feelings. Yeah. And especially in the, in the mind of a preteen, they're trying to find 
their sense of identity. So that right. justice is really, really important to them. So I have to remember that too. Justice, rightness, what are you going to do to her? She, we proved that she did this to me. So, so what's going to happen to her? Huh? Huh? What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and I know that they're not asking me to challenge my parenting. And I have to believe that they're asking me because they need to see justice happen. And so uh, approaching this to answer your question in in an ideal sense, I think would be to come in as the coach instead of the dictator right? and to help them ask questions and to know that I don't need to squash this right now. This is not necessarily a time factor right now. If I'm focusing on building their character. Yeah. The biggest challenge for me, and I, and I ideally want to do this is instead of react to the anger, especially if it's like wildly inappropriate, to stop and actually ask, so you're feeling angry because, or, or something like that mm-hmm. to first honor the, I'm sorry, you feel angry or, oh, do you need a hug or something? And it is like the last thing on my mind. If I see a child mistreat another child or someone speak disrespectfully. And yet at core, There's something that's not quite, like you said, sitting right, or it feels unjust or misrepresented or so many possibilities, and they need to feel heard. They might not even know what they're feeling. And so then helping to identify what they're feeling. But just like you said, (laughs) this is the work of homeschooling that I did not know I signed up for. And it's not the pretty stuff. I don't even know how to capture it on Instagram, but I'm really sure that my almost 17-year-old and 13-year-old wouldn't let me. For sure. No. And that's true too, especially yeah. as, um, you know, women in, in our position too, because we, we uh, both of us obviously feel strongly about helping other moms get through yeah. these times. And yeah. we need to be honest about the conflicts we have without, you know, yeah. without putting our kids as they say on blast or shaming yeah. them publicly or something, yeah. but just approaching it from a, this is a human condition. This isn't just yeah. like, Oh, I have I have these kind of kids uh, rolling my eyes all the time. I, I don't want to be that mom in real life or, you know, in virtual life. It's, it's just, it's just the, the stage of raising kids and being human, but more so yeah. recognizing our humanness. So that's why I focus yeah, a whole exactly. lot less on this is how you homeschool. Right. <laughs> exactly. This is how you can respond when you feel the big feelings of motherhood while you're homeschooling. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. Big feelings of motherhood. That's so true. Not the ones I thought the ones I signed up for are watching them at bedtime and going, Oh, aren't they so perfect? Or <laughs> them wanting to do things that are fun and create memories with me. And they're scrapbookable, although I don't scrapbook anymore, but or Instagram <laughs> accountable. You actually speak about helping moms discover their strengths and learn to live free from unrealistic expectations. I'd love to talk about how you encourage homeschool moms to do that. Oh, it, it begins with just getting to know the individual person. I want to step away from stereotypical um, mother woman behavior I mean because we were all made individual by God and we all have individual personalities and events and um things in our lives that affect who we are today right yeah so getting to know ourselves and what we really excel at not not everyone is that social emotional uh, awareness person. I mean, and I had to come to grips with that too, just because I saw certain things in a situation doesn't mean that everyone thinks that way. Right. And that just told me that, okay, Jen, you're more of a natural teacher, counselor. I, I, I talked to a mom recently, actually, I, I, I met her for the first time this week. Um, and she says, wow, I admire what you do, but that is not me. Right. And I said, I am glad to know that you know yourself that you're not a checklist person. You're not a sit and teach the math person. She's just like, nope, I can't, I can't, I know myself and we'd have a much better relationship if we didn't interact that way. And I said, okay, so knowing yourself is the first step. And so moving forward and interacting with the humans you're responsible for um, is, is the next step. And so it depends where the mom is coming from, because I, I get mostly homeschool moms on my platform because that's, 
that's who I am. But moms I meet in the community or um, at my kids' sports events who are not directly involved in their kids' education, but they're just as much dedicated to it, right? I can see almost immediately what their strengths are when we, we talk for any length of time. Some moms are really, really good with organization and numbers. Some moms are really great at playing with their kids and getting actively yeah. involved in the sports and stuff. And that so wasn't me, but I admire those ones. Also the oh, crafty ones. Same here. <laughs> the crafty and also the crafty ones. The yeah. one oh and you can tell just what they love, you know? And so getting to the root with mothers about the things that really light them up. Right. Like this lights me up talking me about too. feelings and education. This lights me up. <laughs> I'm dying not- to ask you, are you an Enneagram, Enneagram too? I can take that out of the, yes, I, you, <laughs> you guessed it. <laughs> I did. The fact that you, you could read it. a room that fast. Yes. That was, that's yeah. the thing that tipped me off besides you said helping. Mom. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And the helping, the, the helper is the huge thing, right? Yeah. Um, me too. Yeah. But helping help. It, I mean, you know, you mentioned the Enneagram, just looking at tools like that. I mean, it, it's not scripture, of course, but it's, it's a, it's another tool for helping cool. us understand yeah. each other because these personality traits are often grouped together. And I can tell just by asking questions, you know, what's important to someone. Yeah. I can tell the moms that I'm not going to hang out with much, not for any negative reason, but just mm-hmm. that they are super outdoorsy. And I had to tell a mom once, I said, I love you. I love sitting and talking with you, but I will probably never go hiking with you. (laughs) Okay, girl, (laughs) you you are not allowed to be in Hawaii because those of us that would love to be in Hawaii want to experience water sources that you have because I heard you don't like water as well. And you're like, you're not hiking in Hawaii. Okay. All right. Well, you do you. (laughs) I will hike. I I will. I will do it, but not like uh, as a rule. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I know it's, it's interesting that, you know, uh, I would love to bank on the fact or even like build a platform on the fact that I'm homeschooling in Hawaii, but no, Jen's kind of a, <laughs> kind of a indoor library girl, yeah. um, who fell in love with a Hawaiian man. That's right. my story. Okay. Yeah. He was born and raised here yeah. and he does the outdoor stuff. I will go, but it's not my natural comfort zone. Right. Yes. But yeah. even getting away from the guilt of that, I, okay, yeah. this, this, when it comes to knowing your strengths too, yeah. I, for the longest time, I, I felt very, very guilty for not embracing where I live as much as other people think I should, or as much yeah, as sorry about that one. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't a judgment coming or felt at all. It, it's just, it's something I've had to wrestle with because, you know, you bloom where God plants you is mm-hmm. kind of the, 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 the cliche, cliche in my head, but who am I and how do I give my most natural self to my kids? Mm-hmm. I am completely drained after a day outside. So I you're not a Charlotte myself. Mason homeschooler then? <laughs> well, I mean, in theory, I'd like to think I am. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. No, no, no. But, but, you know, discussion, yeah. but the other thing is, you know, where we live, we live in, in the city. We live in, in an oh. urban part of Honolulu. We can, of yeah. course, drive to the nearest, um, you know, be the, we're, we're pretty close to the beach. We're pretty relatively close. So we could drive to get there. But our immediate neighborhood, oh, I'm so jealous sometimes of the mamas who live on land. I think, I think um, when I was reading about you, you guys can homestead, right? And you, right. you have yeah. your, your beautiful areas. You can just send the kids outside to, I send my kids outside to concrete and busy streets. And, right. you know, so yeah. if you are homeschooling in an urban area, yeah, you, you're taking into account constantly, like, how do I use my greatest strengths as, as a mom, as a woman, as the person I am, given the environment where we're planted right now, right. you know? Yes. So I love to just talk moms through first the facts, right? We have to just observe, observe what is actually our life, observe yeah. what is actually That's your so personality, good. his yeah. personality, your husband's personality, and yeah. how that kind of can work together. Because when we're in our own situation, it's harder to see because we're close to it, right? right? So the coaching aspect or just being in a community with other mamas, 
I can affirm that I see this strength in you. You can affirm that you see this strength in me because I probably didn't realize it, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of where that it starts. We just have to look at what is and not get too idealistic, but instead have those things as goals. Because if this is who I am, but this is who my child is, let's say my child is super adventurous, competitive. Mm-hmm. My daughter, oh, she would do all the outside things and compete. So I, I put her in sports. So right. that means mom has to go sit in the hot sun and watch her play sports. And yeah. that's what needs to happen because the love and connection is more important than my comfort at that point right. <laughs> in that moment. <laughs> That's a really good way to frame dealing with your unrealistic expectations. I also speak to um, homeschooling. Is it working for you? And uh, I am not a true unschooler. I don't really know what I am anymore. I'm a hybrid between classical homeschooling and uh, unschooling is what I think. And <laughs> what's that? I it's feel so, like that too. <laughs> you too? Oh, that's I so love cool. certain aspects of classical. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, let's just naturally figure let's out. Let's unschool it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Yay. There's two of us. That's funny. Yes. Y'all can join the next homeschool method. No, actually, I don't want to. <laughs> I want to be a leader of the movement. Yeah. Classical unschooling. Yeah. We're why not? It. Okay. New hashtag. Okay. But that's actually my point. My point was I would never encourage anybody to to sign up for any of them or maybe do all of them and then discover none of them are going to fit you perfectly. And mm-hmm. so just play with it. But the goal is, is it working for you? And, right. and observe if it's working for you. And I know I wouldn't purposefully direct people to radically unschool from the beginning because that would scare the pants off most people. But I would say, observe what your children are doing and discover that they are indeed learning with or without your input and so that you just get more comfortable with the concept of education. So I I use that observing concept in that realm and you're using it in the one of the homeschool mom and saying, let's observe what my unrealistic expectations are or who Mm -hmm. our family really is what my needs really are maybe and what my kids needs really are. And now is it working for you in a whole different way? Right. Right. Um, I recently developed an acronym related to this because something that I'm building alongside practical family. I mean, I started practical family, just wanting to focus on like the practical what's needed now. What's, what's the most meaningful things that, that we can bring out of family life. And now I'm, merging, and I haven't said this publicly yet, or at least on someone else's podcast, but I'm merging my practical family podcast into the enough mom podcast. Oh, good. So we're talking about enoughness from a lot of different angles. First, we're going going to focus on time, but what your, um, I think what, what reminded me about what you just said was the acronym that I came up with is over O V E R. Okay. And it begins with the observe and why I, I think I keep doing the first, the facts, first, the facts, what's happening, what's actually going on, the observe, the O, observe what, what, it, what's going on, or what am I feeling? Um, I know, I'm sorry, the feeling comes, comes next. First, it's the observe what's happening, like my kids, they're yeah. fighting, okay. My kids are fighting. I have dinner on. I have to get to this meeting, whatever is actually happening. So we can list all of the, the possible triggers of mm-hmm. the moment. Next is V, which is vent. Um, this is where we get to say out loud or in prayer, what am I feeling because of the events that are happening? Right. Next is E. And so I, I kind of make it a, a, an illusion of crossing a bridge. So we have to cross the bridges of struggle by asking, asking ourselves, how, how am I going to get over this bridge? First, I observe, then I vent, then E is embrace. I embrace what's true, what's reality. You know, the, the, the truth of the matter is my, my kids are disrespecting each other and they, they're having big feelings. And I don't need to be pulled into their conflict. I can stay as the outside coach of I'm going to help you to resolve this. And the feelings aren't going to be personal attacks on me because we are going to figure this out together. Right. right. 
And then the last one is R, which is reframe. So now I get to reframe. It's kind of like reparenting, right? I get to reframe what is actually happening. So I don't stay stuck on this side of the bridge. I can cross over these bridges of struggle, even when it comes to overwhelm. You know, I feel overwhelmed right now. Why? What is happening? Well, this and this and this and this and this is happening. But what is true? Yeah. I get to rest. I get to ask for time to rest. Or I get to say, I need 10 minutes alone, usually in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. And I get to pray through it. I get to take deep breaths. I get to yes. pause and reflect and reframe the situation so that I can approach it differently later. Um, and so I find that these small steps for moms gives them permission to just think you can, you can use your own mind. You don't have to ask permission from anyone else. Your husband is not the decider of your, dis, your personal decisions. You know, if you come from that kind of, you know, Christian background, I know a lot of people do, um, you get to work through this yourself and give your kids tools to do the same. That is beautiful. And I know that listeners, regular listeners to this podcast will say, have you guys talked about this before? Because a lot of the things that you just said, uh, but you put it in a really beautiful picture for us to imagine, but is is stuff that I'm constantly discussing. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that like that observing the reframing, Mm -hmm. seeing things that are actually true, because our thoughts, they're not necessarily true. They're just Mm -hmm. not. They're trained by our experiences, by just like you said, fight or flight sometimes, all Mm -hmm. sorts of different dynamics, but they're not necessarily true. We need to slow things down. I want to ask you unrealistic expectations. What do you think the most common ones are of a lot of homeschool parents? Hmm. Let me see. (laughs) There are many. (laughs) Yes, there are. Um, yeah. unrealistic expectations that my kids will be interested or even excited about doing school every day. Yeah. <laughs> Amen, sister. <laughs> Most day. And, and I, I think this is what can discourage a mother very quickly because from our side of things, you, you, you've sacrificed a lot, whether it's, oh. you know, your time, your energy, your career, possibly, to stay home and homeschool these kids and they are stinking ungrateful every day. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why we moved to unschooling (laughs) because you invest so much time in whatever it is. In the beginning for me, it was Pinterest and I would go to Pinterest and I would like to call it pin schooling, but I had all these ideas and amazing (laughs) ideas and I'd write them down and I'd prep for all this stuff and buy some stuff and we were going to have so much fun and then they didn't want to. And even if I forced it, because I definitely did, and we would do it anyway, that definitely did not mean that you had happy kids at the end and it wasn't fun. Like I thought it should be fun. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah I think that, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. <clears throat> that is such a good point though. When we were, because we're going to go to things like Pinterest and all the websites we're told to go to, to, to find amazing things. And there are amazing things. I think mm-hmm. the unrealistic expectation is, is believing that because we found an amazing thing it, with all of our life experience. And even as a teacher, I mean, I'm technically, I'm a trained teacher. Yeah. That doesn't make me an automatically wonderful homeschool mom. I think that's another unrealistic expectation too, that if you, if you teach that it's going to work out <clears throat> because how your kids respond to it also doesn't mean that it's the wrong decision because they're like, nah, I don't want to do it. You know, that's just them being human. Yeah. That's just that. That's just them being a five-year-old and seven-year-old, a 13-year-old, you know, and, and we don't have to take that personally, or that does not need to be an indicator that homeschool is not working. That's just another chance for us to, to parent right? or to say, I'm, I'm the leader. I'm your guide. I'm your gentle, loving guide. I love you. We are going to do this and maybe making the time short or building the time increments up. Yeah. I think that that's the other expectation too. And what a lot of moms ask about is how much time should this take? And and I'm saying, that's a great question. It depends how old your kids are. It depends on their, um, 
their personality also, because I talk to a lot of moms with children who are extra energetic or extra strong willed. And Uh that takes a completely different approach a lot of times. Yes. That's actually why I went for it on schooling. Yeah. 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 See, you know, and because the methods just don't work. Um, My daughter, for instance, uh, she's the oldest. Well, technically, because she's 11 months oldest. (laughs) She, the way she came out is just, she loves the schedules and structure and she thrives in that. My son takes longer to transit transition into activities. And what I realized um, more recently is that he most likely has ADHD and we've talked with him about this. He understands that we watch videos and things like that, which allowed me to pay attention to even the way I do things. I might have a touch of it. He may have gotten it from me. Mommy needs timers to keep herself on track Mommy has poor working memory. That's why she needs to have calendars like this in front of her face. You know, that's why things need to be written down. I I need checklists because I need to manage how my brain works. Yeah, that's probably me too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and expecting children to learn the same is also unrealistic. That's that's probably um, the biggest thing is, I thought it would be the most convenient to teach them at the same time, which is good. I, I can take them through most subjects, most of the same subjects, and we'll just appropriate for what um, they're able to do, right? They, they have slightly different maths, but I'm not too worried about the grade level thing unless somebody asked for records purposes. Um, schooling them at the same time, I think I expected it to be very streamlined and very breezy, yeah. but I have to accommodate for their learning style and their personality. I have to. So there's a or whole else. bunch of flexibility okay. training really. In <laughs> yeah. It's you're paying attention. Like, let's just pay attention and, and ask ourselves, ask the Lord, like, what is the most important thing that needs to happen today? And I've realized that the less giving them, putting expectations like on a board we have a whiteboard in the living room where today this is what we're tackling and it's just subjects I don't even write the specific documentary we're going to watch or the specific book we're going to read you know I just say we're doing math writing maybe science but they're also doing speech and debate right now so there is a lot of research that comes with that organically which is great right And then their outside time is their sports or their martial arts. And um, it doesn't need to be more than that unless there's a specific goal, like a research paper that needs to be presented um, or an oral report or a speech that has to be given, you know? Uh Yeah. So just managing day-to-day expectations, really. So you speak about being confident in the calling of your motherhood. Um, Mm -hmm. You actually had a really great... You had a really great graphic that shared five different points in how you can be confident in the calling of motherhood, that you need to admit when you need help, you need to be willing to change your habits, ask for what you need without apology, identify your strengths, and use your strengths. I'm guessing you learned all these things from your story of motherhood yourself. Tell me about how you learned all of that. I did. I am not looking at the graphic you shared, but I'm sure I created it at some point. <laughs> I love um, that. Spoken like a writer. <laughs> I'm such a writer. Like it comes out of my head and I forget that I did it. So that's the working memory part. <laughs> yes. And also when you're a writer, you're just writing so much stuff constantly that mm-hmm. you're like, oh, sometimes you tell yourself, that's good advice. Did I write that? <laughs> Dang, I should use that. <laughs> right. And it's, it's completely, I, I, I mean, I'm conv- it's not just a gift. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's an ability that's exercised over time. Because if you're passionate about communicating truth, however that comes out. For me, I, I think I'm more of a, a natural speaker who writes. You know, I, I am more comfortable with conversation than sitting and crafting the words. I mean, the words just... Eventually they come out when I spend time on them, but it's, it comes from life. It comes from, 
I'm just a continual observer and listener of, of right. the human experience. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just extra inspired to to put lists like this together. So I'm happy to talk through it. Can you just go through them one by one for me? <laughs> so admit when you need help. So that is especially challenging for us Enneagram type two, because we are the helpers. We are the helpers. Um, I read that, you know, being a type two, there comes the, uh, you know, the, the downfalls or the sin of pride can get, can get in there. And it's like, I don't like to hear that, but it's true. Yes, that's, it's, true. it's cliche, but that's actually what everybody says that twos don't want to hear that. And I have to ask myself, why, why wouldn't I want to hear that? Maybe in the moment where I truly believe that I've come up with the solution to the problem. Yeah. Or I know the best way to handle this and trusting yeah. someone else to handle it in a way that I wouldn't do it is right. pride. Yeah. It's pride. <clears throat> um, believing that we shouldn't have to ask for help if we were already capable. Right. It's pride. Yeah. Um, believing that it's not that bad. Whatever is happening, it's not as bad as it could be because we're comparing ourselves to starving people in Africa, maybe. Yeah. Or, you know, our situation as, um, uh, can be seen as oh this is just a first world problem or this is right you know my, my yeah. friend is going through cancer it's much worse I should not be complaining right. when I need a meal because I'm sick I can't get out of bed you know yeah um, we put so much back to the expectation thing I think we put so much expectation on ourselves to handle all the things just because we can theoretically, or maybe even just physically we can, but we don't need to. A huge theme in my life as a Christian, Teresa, has been just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yes, that is something I wrote down what you what you said. Oh, Lord, yeah. oh, okay, I'm glad I included it on there because again, this is coming just from memory. Because it's um, an unrealistic expectation. That's why I wrote it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, Anyway, I don't want to veer too, too far off because we could talk about this part forever. But, but the need to ask for help um, is important because we don't have to shoulder the burden that we think we do much of the time. That right. it's okay to create space for rest. It's okay. It's, it's okay. And, and we have to ask ourselves, where is this coming from? This expectation that I that I should just keep trucking on. Or if I stop, that means what? Mm-hmm. Did somebody tell you that if you stop doing this much, then you're lazy? Yeah. We're, we're yeah. equating um, moral failings to permission to give our bodies and our minds the rest that we need. Yeah. And I, and, and we need to stop that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you said willing to change habits. That definitely is something that parenting has taught me like it really wasn't something I signed up for but you know all the things that we spoke to in the beginning of this conversation willing to change habits what would you say to that we we can get in this um season of um functional fixedness and this is a term that I learned from another book I'll remember who wrote it in a second but Functional fi- fixedness is when we've been doing something a certain way for so long that it works. So why fix it? If it ain't broke, don't fix right. it. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and that can come with um, how we respond to difficult situations, routines, you know, living the life that we're used to living, um, handling conflict in a certain way. Yeah. So being willing to change our approach to any of those things is an important step toward healing, toward creating a new culture, and even in our home, around the way that we handle things. Like, I don't need to be an angry, yelling mommy anymore. I don't need to live that life. I don't need to be that person. I have to be willing to make small changes lower my voice, decide not to maybe respond immediately Mm -hmm. to high trigger things, 
Um, I have to be willing to change something Mm -hmm. to move forward, even if it's one little thing at a time. Because if we're not willing to change, we stay stuck. It's like it's like um, water that doesn't have an outlet. It stays stagnant and it gets gross and mucky. And, you know, that can be the condition of our heart when we're not willing to let things flow out, to talk about it, to come back around, to dig new pathways for new water to flow, to to nourish something, you know, just to give you a picture of what it feels like when, when we refuse to change, we don't need to be stagnant pools of water. We can be Mm -hmm. living, breathing, flowing Mm -hmm. families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you say to ask for what you need without apology, which assumes that you know what you need. Right. The first step is figuring out what you need. <laughs> yeah. And a lot, for a lot of us, it's, um, it's the need to rest, especially homeschool moms. It's the need for alone time. Yeah. Even if we don't think that that is a real legitimate need, I challenge mamas to consider being alone. I making totally time. agree. I literally was writing about this yesterday because oh. I have heard many homeschool moms share that, but I'm extroverted and I actually really <laughs> like hanging out with my kids. And that's great. Like that is truly great. Mm-hmm. Knowing who you are outside of that homeschool mom identity will come in handy when your children graduate, yes. but it also, it just creates this solitude space for you. Why would you say that that's a value? Mm. Well, a, a lot of the reasons you just mentioned, Teresa, that's so good because we need to know ourselves apart from our kids, yeah. apart from our husband. Yeah. I mean, sure. You're our husband. It, it, we are, we are one with our husband. We're, we're a partnership. I, I would continue that to make sure we understand that we are an equal partnership and we have equal needs. Yeah. <clears throat> when I began to not ask well it it began with the question like how would this affect you honey if I took Monday nights to myself like because we we run a restaurant okay that's our family business and and my husband is has crazy different words all the time it's not a set schedule so I I approached him in in a way to respect his time and his energy to say I need this for myself I need something like this idea for myself which night could work for you? Could you know that you would more likely than not be home with the kids so that I can take this for myself? Yeah. And it was a step, it it was a brave step for me because I was still fighting all of those feelings of selfishness. Like I'm being self-serving. I, you know, um, this is my job. This is my full-time job. If we're committing to have me stay at home, then I am the homemaker. I am the 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 manager of the home and I happily take on that role. Yes, I do think we need to manage our home. I don't think we need to do absolutely everything in our home. We that's where we outsource. That's where we think of ways to do it. But also, I'm here all of the time. Right. I needed a chance to get outside. And so what I do on Monday nights is I leave. I, I might if I have time to prepare dinner for them ahead of time. Girl, I don't mind doing that. Great. Sometimes I'll just say, "Honey, I." I don't have plans for dinner. Go ahead and eat whatever you guys want. Um, But I leave at a certain time. Yeah. Because literally nobody out there has a job where they are on 24 seven. Yeah. Well, actually that's, that is hilarious that I say that because my husband (laughs) is the chief of staff at a local hospital. So for the last two years, it does actually feel like that. (laughs) Well, he's on call, right? Just my husband, stuff breaks our business. Our business can't function. He has to be there. Mm-hmm. And I get that. Okay. So I hear a lot from military spouses too. We have a pretty large con- contingency of, <clears throat> of military folks here in Hawaii. Cause it's a, it's, there are many bases, right? This is a, yeah. a major um, a spot for them to, to, to come. Um, you know, the mamas who have to be mom and dad when dad is deployed, but even when dad's home working the normal job, you know, mama, mama needs time, but then there's this, uh, what I hear from them is there, there can be the sense of guilt to where, because mm-hmm. daddy's gone a lot, we need to savor the time we have with him at night on the weekend. It needs to be family time. And it, it's been difficult for me because I've given myself permission and the freedom to just be 
wherever with the kids, whenever I need to be, nice. because my husband's in and out a lot. I, I don't get to see them on the weekend because that's when daddy's home. But nice. at the same time, I wonder, and I've asked them before, if you could, could you do like a girl's night out? Would that be okay? Or do you, do you feel like you can't? And much of the time they respond with, well, I've never really asked for that. Uh huh. Yeah. That was how I thought it in the beginning as well. Um, but there's something magical about going to the grocery store alone. And I don't recommend grocery store as your time away, but when you <laughs> are there alone and you come back home, your kids are happy to see you. Mm-hmm. That's just an hour in a grocery store, which really doesn't serve you. It really doesn't. But at the same time, it feeds you. That's good. If you could find a place where you do whatever you want anywhere, just for an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever you have, you come back refreshed and you see those little faces and you're like, I'm so glad your little faces are in my world. Mm -hmm. It's a shift. I actually think that's the one thing that I think uh, parents in school have an advantage so that maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. I also had my kids in school until um, the end of grade two was my oldest and just seeing them again and going, Oh, hi, nice to see you. Tell me about your day. There was a reconnect moment. Whereas at home, it's, it's just not the same unless you're going to the grocery store. So then uh, you really just need to find somewhere anywhere to do something. That's just about you. Yeah just just about you it's not selfish it's it's getting to know yourself and if you find that it's an uncomfortable place to be sit in the discomfort sit sit there and ask yourself why is this uncomfortable because my identity has been attached to this role or that role or maybe just use the time to sit and pray I mean I think you know I, I binge watch shows as much as the next modern mama but but there's something to be said for just complete silence and breathing, deep breathing, praying, asking the Lord to comfort you. Yeah. Even without saying anything, you know, and, and so those rhythms of, of rest can be new to a lot of modern mamas with a lot going on with a lot of the, you know, we don't even need to hit the technology thing, right? That's, we know it's there, but, but figuring out how, figuring out the how to, to be just, just as I was surprised by, I don't get to teach as much of the what content to my kids as much as the how, how to be a student. That's right. I need to, to practice learning how to be a better mama, you know, a more yeah. connected mama, a more peaceful joyful mama. And those feelings don't often come with doing more. I know they, they definitely don't come with doing more because you get distracted by all the things. And then who are you? What are you really all about? Mm-hmm. I have so many things that I would love to chat with you about so many different directions we could go. I, I sense that the writer to writer, I remember seeing somewhere that you first discovered writing with your grandma's old typewriter. And I'm like, Oh, we're, we're so similar that way. I didn't find a typewriter. I found a little green journal, a locked journal from the local Zellers. And that was my beginning into writing. But you know, we writers have a lot of thoughts and I would love to have you back and chat about all sorts of things. Would you tell me what kind of resources you have available and where we find you online? Sure. Well, I'm uh, at practicalfamily.org and um, forgive me, I need to pull up the thing I wanted to mention the most. But um, anyway, if you just go there, practicalfamily.org, you'll find uh, opportunities for uh, personal coaching, whether you're a homeschool mom, or I also coach um, other writers and speakers in their digital platform opportunities. So uh, if you just want to chat about message development and things like that, but you know, if you're, if you're a mom and you're just trying to figure this whole thing out and, and um you just need a little direction and a little bit of maybe validation. I mean, you're probably not as far off as you think you are. Then, you know, schedule an appointment with me and we'll talk about it. Um, I also am starting this community called uh, the Enough Mom Collective, where okay. it's going to go into the podcast as well. The Enough Mom podcast will 
we'll talk about these issues of enoughness and time, but also I'll bring on guest uh, speakers, guest authors to to speak to these areas of motherhood. Um, and it'll just be an all around great thing. Um, but yeah, there, there are many resources available there if you want to check that out. I very much appreciate your authenticity. You're just sharing the reality of what homeschooling or what your family life is like. And I hear that on your podcast as well. So I encourage people to check you out on all the podcast players that Google, the (laughs) what are we doing? Google, Spotify, Apple, and other places. Yeah. Yeah. It has been such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Teresa. God bless you. I'm so glad that you are part of the Homeschool Mama self-care podcast community. I can't wait to get to know you more and your homeschooled kiddos. I encourage you to jump on to my website, www.capturingthecharmlife.com. This podcast explores aspects of self-care that I hope will serve the real homeschool mom in her real homeschool days. Because there are a few issues that most homeschool moms grapple with. To build into this community, I have created a Patreon community. Be a supporter and you receive access to my Patreon-only feed, access to extended guest interviews, discounts on group mentoring, intensives, and masterminds, all the archived Patreon episodes and content, a community of like-minded homeschool moms. You can also access monthly support chats and Ask Me Anything days. I'm really looking forward to building into this community, building into you and getting to know you. If you're interested in joining the Homeschool Mama self-care Patreon community, you can check me out on patreon.com homeschool mama self-care. I'll see you there.